artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay.
Well, I heard the story this week of a, a contractor who decided it was time to retire. And so the owner of the company, though, asked him, hey, could you build one last house? And so reluctantly, the contractor agreed to build the house, but his, his heart really wasn't in it. So as he was building it, he didn't kind of put the normal care that he, that he would into a, a home. He didn't really oversee the different crews like he should. He ended up actually also using inferior materials. And so it just wasn't his best work, but he got the job finished. And then to his surprise, when he finished the job and told his boss, his boss actually handed him the keys to that house. He was actually building his own house. The, the, the owner of the company wanted to give this final house as a gift to him, but unfortunately, that contractor hadn't paid special attention to the house because he didn't realize it was his house. And, and so what we want to do is kind of think about that is this idea that this contractor didn't focus on the ending. He only focused about how he felt in the moment, what he wanted to do, and he didn't put the effort in needed to build a good house. But you see, that's kind of the story of all of us. In cooperation with the Lord, the Lord's our boss, and we're the contractor of our own houses, if you will. Each of us are building our own house, and one day, the Lord will give us the keys to the house that we have built. And so to prove my point, hold on to 1 Peter, and would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 for just a moment? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15, and we see Paul using just this sort of imagery of the house. Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. So Paul is talking about himself as a worker, right? Somebody that had helped establish the church there in Corinth and, you know, talking about different people who have helped establish a church, Apollos and Peter and others. And he says, you are God's field, you are God's building. So he's speaking of believers. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. So here's all this instruction for believers that we, there's this, this foundation and we're gonna see who that foundation is in just a minute. But then we have a responsibility to build on that foundation. Notice verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation of our house, of the house that we're building in cooperation with the Lord. The Lord Jesus is the foundation. So at salvation, you have that foundation. But if you've ever dr driven by a, a site, you know, a, a building site, you realize that construction doesn't stop at the foundation. The foundation is only good if you build something on it. Something needs to come on top. And so now Paul says we have a choice of what materials we're going to build on that foundation. Notice, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, those stones speak of, of marble, of building stones. He says, or wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. So as us in cooperation with the Lord, as we focus on the ending, realizing someday we're going to be given the keys to this house that we're building in cooperation with the Lord, we have a choice on which building materials that we'll use. Will we use gold, silver, and precious stones which signify obedience to the Lord? Or will we build with wood, hay, and straw, which signifies as the three little piggies, <laughs> you know, the inferior building materials that can't stand the heat of the day of judgment, or not, sorry, not the day of judgment, but the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. Notice verse 13, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And so this, this exhortation and this section of scripture that has just penetrated my heart long ago and has never left it is this reality that as we live our lives, as we seek to, as Ephesians 2.10 says, to walk out the good works that God's prepared beforehand for us, we are building a house. And that the, but the day is coming where God, the great inspector, is going to inspect that house. And when those things that we did in obedience to him and for his glory, then what happened? It's going to remain and we'll receive a reward. But those things that, that we you know, lost opportunities, didn't take advantage of them, did them from the wrong motive, well, those things will be burned away. But please notice it says in verse 15, this is not about salvation because the foundation remains. 
but it's a choice of how we'll build on it. And so as we think about that illustration of the contractor, if he had realized this is going to be my house, this is going to be the place where I'm going to dwell, then I believe he would have treated it differently. And so you and I, if we can focus on the ending, if we realize that the life we're building now actually is, is in eternity is going to be a continuation of this life, right? That, that the things that we're building in, the, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, how we're treating people, all of those things are going to have an impact for who we become for eternity. Well, then that changes everything. That changes everything about how we do life. So with this reality in mind, will you turn to the passage we'll be studying this morning? Again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. And I joke about going through seven verses. If you're visiting, it's because week one, I took two verses. And then last week, I took three verses. And so this is a whole lot. And we'll see how we do. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Peter writes, In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into." So I've entitled this message, again, Focus on the Ending, and we're going to spend our time exploring two exhortations. We'll spend the majority of our time in this first exhortation, which is rejoice in your future. That's my exhortation through this passage, rejoice in your future. The second exhortation that we'll spend less time on is study your salvation. So rejoice in your future and study your salvation. So let's move into our first section, that's rejoice in your future. We find this in verses 6 through 9, and Peter begins with these words, in this you greatly rejoice. Well, what's the this that Peter's referring to? So would you look back a few verses to those verses that we studied last week? Because this is the this. Is the this. These verses are the this that Peter's referring to. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Peter wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So with that in mind, we look again at 1 Peter 1.6 and we read, in this you greatly rejoice. Okay, so we're gonna explore that. We're gonna think about that. But, I want to, but for the time being, I want to examine this phrase, you greatly rejoice, because it's actually one word in the Greek. You greatly rejoice is one word in the Greek, and it means to jump for joy. It means to rejoice exceedingly. It means to be exceedingly glad. And so the first thing that came to my mind when I thought about this is how when I get up in the mornings before I go off to school or go off to the coffee shop, I go and feed the dogs. Now, we have two dogs, and they're getting a little bit older, a little gray in the beard. But one of them, Scout, she jumps over two feet high every morning in her kennel when I come to feed her. Every morning, without fail. She jumps for joy at the thought of being fed. And that's what I thought about. Now, Atticus, our other dog, he's a little bit older, and he only has three legs. I'm not, you know, you guys could say awe or something. You know, unfeeling. There you go. So rude to Atticus. <laughs> and the funny thing about him is he still tries to jump. <laughs> yes, oh, it, it doesn't work out very well, but he does his best. And so when we think about this, you greatly rejoice, as believers, we're to jump for joy. Now, whether literally or metaphorically, if you spend any time around young kids, you see that it's easy for young kids to jump for joy. 
they have so much energy and they're rolling around and all this kind of stuff. And then for us, some of us, as we get older, we're like, I hope that I don't ever go to the ground because I don't think I'll get back up. <laughs> And so maybe we will be in the place in life where we're not jumping for joy literally anymore, but we can still jump for joy metaphorically. We can still jump for joy in our hearts. We can still greatly rejoice. And so this, this greatly rejoicing, again, it ties back to verses three through five. If you weren't here last week or you're interested in that, you know, the message I did on verses three through five, it's online, it's on YouTube, it's on our, our website. I would encourage you to explore that, to think about that. Because this is what Peter is saying we should jump for joy about, that we're to greatly rejoice, jump for joy in the abundant mercy we have received from the Lord, in the living hope that we enjoy because we serve a living Christ, in our incorruptible inheritance that we look forward to, and the fact that we're kept by God. All of that are verses three through five. And so Peter is saying to persecuted Christians in difficult situations, he's saying to them, hey, greatly rejoice, not at your circumstances, but it, all these truths are, that are about you. See, it's very important for us. If we're going to be consistent believers who consistently live out our faith, we must focus primarily on the vertical and secondarily on the horizontal. Our first and foremost attitude must be vertical. Our first and foremost attitude must be about the Lord and what he's done for us and what promises hold for us and focus on the ending. If we focus primarily on the horizontal, we're gonna be just like the world. And we're gonna be consumed with all oh, high prices and political situation and the latest pandemic and all of those things and we'll just be worldlings. That's the reality. And if we focus all our time on the horizontal, then we're building with wood, hay, and straw. But if we focus our minds and our hearts primarily on the vertical, then what's gonna happen? We're gonna build with gold, silver, and precious stones. And that's exactly what Jesus said when they were, he was asked about the greatest commandment. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's vertical. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's horizontal. You put them both together, you have the cross, right? You have the vertical, you have the horizontal. You have Jesus sent by God to love people, right? You have both. Jesus says, I only do those things that the Father sent me to do. So it's vital if we're gonna be these people who, who rejoice in our future, who focus on the ending, that we focus primarily on the vertical, secondarily on the horizontal. With this in mind, would you turn to Colossians chapter three? See what Paul had to say about this, or one of the places he had something to say about this. He's talked about it a lot. Colossians chapter three. I wanna look at verses one through four. Paul wrote, if then you were raised with Christ, and if you are a believer, you were raised with Christ. His resurrection okay, guarantees your resurrection. He is the, the, the first fruits of the resurrection. So if you were raised with Christ, notice what we should do. Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Is, is have that vertical attitude. That vertical attitude. So, and then it says, verse two, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So I love these two words, seek and set. Seek those things that are above, actively pursue them, and set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Seek and set. Verse three, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. See, you died with Christ on the cross in some spiritual way that I can't understand. You and I as believers died with him. We've died to this present world system. We're, we're, we're here, um, you know, in, in a sense as ghosts. We're here. This is not our real life. We're going to come into real life later. Please don't misunderstand. Sometimes we think, okay, well, this is the real world. And then when I go to heaven, that's the ethereal world. No, I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, this world is a shadow lands. That when we go to heaven, that's the real, real world. That's the solid place. Verse four, notice, for when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So put this all together. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I want you to focus on that because that's gonna be a, a main topic in this message, this idea that we have future glory coming to us. Okay, that, that there, we're gonna be glorified with Christ and that we're seeking that glory. There's a lot of people seeking glory in this life, seeking glory in this world, seeking prominence in this world. And what they've done is they've taken a, a, a true desire and perverted it. 
you were made to desire glory. You were made to desire significance and importance and purpose. It's only found in the Lord. But what happens is people, myself included, we want to take a shortcut. Ah, that just seems too far off and that seems too long away. Why don't I just seek it now? Why don't I just seek it here? And it's temporary and it's fleeting and it doesn't satisfy. And so what we're called to is seek the glory from the Lord. So if you would turn back to 1 Peter 1, 6 as we continue on, notice, in this you greatly rejoice, right? So all that's talked about in verses three through five, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, this probably doesn't make it onto a lot of promise pillows, this verse, but I wanna examine the individual pieces of this verse. So the, ver- the word now there, it means just now, at present, at this moment. So those believers were suffering at the present moment. They were enduring difficulty at the present moment, and that's how it's gonna be for us. We're gonna have these present trials. But notice the trial, it says for a little while. Though now, for a little while. That means a short time a brief time. We all know that time is relative, right? The, the, um, a friend of mine who had this t-shirt and had Einstein on the back and it says everything is relative. It, it said, if you sit with a pretty girl for an hour, it feels like a minute. And if you sit on a hot stove for a minute, it feels like an hour. <laughs> and time is relative. So when we're in the midst of trials, it feels like it's always going to be this way. It feels like it's gonna be forever. But Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying that these trials are for a short time. They're for a brief time. And then notice what he says next, if need be. That means necessary, proper, inevitable from the circumstances. This phrase means there's no alternative method. This is a hard thing for me to hear. This is a hard thing for you to hear. God has to use trials to get us to where he wants us to go. God has to use trials. It's necessary. There's no other way for us to become who he wants us to be without trials. It's impossible. There's no other way. And so we may complain and argue with God and be frustrated with him about it. And and he could, I, I believe he understands that, but there's no alternative method. And then notice these trials are no joke. It says you have been grieved. That phrase means afflicted with sorrow, with distress, it's not something light. It's not, they got your order wrong at Starbucks. <laughs> it's, it's something that tears your heart out, something that gnaws at you, something that brings you down. And then he goes on to say that it's by various trials. That word various is actually the word in the English variegated or many colored. It's getting to be that time of year where you can go you know, to Aldridge or Lowe's or wherever else and get some plants. Right? And so there's these variegated plants that you might plant in your yard, that the leaves have different colors, that the flowers have different colors. And those are beautiful there. But what Peter is saying to us is that when it comes to our trials, they're variegated. They're many colored. They, they, they look different. They're assorted adversities, assorted afflictions, assorted troubles. That's the reality. And so as we think about these trials that God, you know, however we want to use a verbiage that he allows in our life, he brings into our life, the, the reality is we need to examine for just a moment that there's a difference between a trial and a temptation. There's a difference between a trial and a temptation. You see, to give you an example of a trial, would be like you're an athlete in high school and your coaches, they have um, put together a difficult practice for the goal of helping you and your team to get better. That's a trial. You know, if, if you've played sports for any length of time, you've been through trying workouts. You know what it feels like. But the coaches, their goal is not to destroy you. Their, co- their goal is actually to make you better. That's how God uses trials. But a temptation is instead of going to that practice, a friend of yours wants you to fake being sick so you and he can skip practice and go drink instead. That's a temptation. Now, our, our natural sinful tendency is to avoid trials, to, to go after the temptation. But what we have to take to heart is saying, God is using this trial for a good reason. God wants to do something in me through this. So to think about this a little bit more, would you turn to James for just a moment? So turn to James chapter one, verses two through four. James has something to say about these trials. James chapter one, looking at verses two through four, James says something very similar or writes something very similar to what Peter's writing. 
He says, my brethren, so he's again talking to believers, count it all joy. That phrase, all joy, it means full and complete joy. He says, when you fall into various trials, there it is again, various trials, different kinds of afflictions. Here it is, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So God is testing our faith. We're going to see more about that as we move on with Peter. Is, is this test that needs to happen? Verse four, but let patience. Notice that word, but let patience. In other words, allow patience. So, so you and I, we can seek to run out of the trial. We can s- seek to skip practice. We can say, well, I don't really want to get better. I don't want to run faster. I don't want to jump higher. I don't want to do these things. And, and God will allow that to happen, but we won't grow in patience. We won't grow in Christ-likeness. So that word patience there, it means steadfastness. It means endurance. Think about that when you come near the end of your race as a believer and those around you can say, you know, they were steadfast. They endured to the end. Think think about the value in that. So he says, but let patience, steadfastness, endurance, have its perfect work. That's a beautiful word in the Greek. It's teleos, which means finished. Let it have its finished work, its complete work. That you may be perfect and complete. That word complete means complete in all its parts. Complete in all its parts, everything lacking nothing. It's awesome. How does all this happen? Through trials. If, if you want patience, if, if you want God to, to finish his work in you, if you want to be complete in all your parts, you have to be willing to go into the fire. You have to be willing to go through the trial. If you and I desire to be conformed into the image of Christ, which by the way, according to Romans 8, 29, is God's purpose and plan for each one of us as believers to conform us to his image, then we must welcome those trials with joy. You've all had people knock on your door or ring your doorbell that you didn't want there. (laughs) We have a little sign on our door that says about no soliciting. Lots of solicitors, they are no respecter of that sign. (laughs) They still come to the door. And I wish I had better Christian character. I'm usually rude to them. I, I don't want them there, right? But, but that's how we are as the trials ring our doorbell. We don't welcome them. And yet what we're told here is welcome them. Not for the trial itself, but because what the trial is gonna produce, what it's gonna make you into, what God's gonna do that, trusting that he has a purpose and a plan with that. I love what, how Paul puts it in Romans 8, verse 18. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So Paul says, whatever you're suffering, and Paul could speak this from a place of of understanding. Paul suffered greatly. And so if I told you, hey, you say, Steve, you really haven't suffered too much. But Paul has. And so when he says the sufferings that we're having enduring right now are not worthy to be compared, not even on the radar for the glory that's coming to us, well, that means something. And so imagine this. Imagine that today you invested $5,000 in a startup company. And I'll talk to you after service. I have a business opportunity. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's an illustration. Today, you invested $5,000 in a startup company And then in five years, that $5,000 investment yielded you $100 million. You would say, that's pretty good. (laughs) Where do I sign up? Where do I scrape this money together? How do I pick Rick's wallet? You know, any of those things to to get the money together. But but that's like pales in comparison to what God's offering to us. 5,000 to 100 million is nothing compared to sufferings for this brief moment of life for eternal glory. That's what he's offering. That's what he's offering to us. And so we can rejoice in our trials because in reality, we're not rejoicing in our trials themselves, we're rejoicing in our future. So would you, with this in mind, would you turn now to 2 Corinthians chapter four? 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses 16 through 18, we'll look at. So Paul writes, therefore, we do not lose heart. That phrase, do not lose heart, it means uh, we do not turn out to be a coward. That's, that's hard to hear, right? But that's what happens if, if we say, you know what, I'm gonna avoid every t- trial, I'm gonna avoid every difficulty, we're, we're as believers, turn out to be a coward. You know, and, and um, 
I remember being in the movie theater with my dad and, and watching Save and Private Ryan. And then there was this one scene where this one soldier turned out to be a coward and, and his fellow soldier was killed because of his cowardice. And I remember how I felt sitting in that movie theater thinking about what it would be like to be in that position and to, to out of your cowardice, to let your friend die. And so this is what the, the Lord is saying to us. You know, we're, we don't turn out to be a coward. And you know what? The thing is, it's not about you and I mustering up that power. He's given us his Holy Spirit. We have all the resources needed to not be cowards. And so he says, then, therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't turn out to be a coward because even though our outward man is perishing, and that means decaying, even though our bodies are decaying, our bodies are breaking down, yet the inward man is being renewed. And so I think about this, it's like spiritual renovation. That outwardly, our, our, the, kind of the outside of the house, if you will, is breaking down, but meanwhile, unseen to just normal human eyes, God is renovating our insides. He's creating something. He's making something beautiful to be revealed on that last day. So we don't lose heart because our outward man is decaying, but yet our inward man's being renewed, renovated day by day. And then Paul says this in verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. It's light and it's momentary. He says, is working for us a far more exceeding. Now, that phrase, far more exceeding in the Greek, is actually a very interesting word. You know it. It's hyperbole. It's the word hyperbole, but it's not the word hyperbole once. It's the word hyperbole twice. And so in the Greek, what you would do is you would stack these words on top of each other for emphasis. And so he's saying there's this, this exceeding glory for us is hyperbole, hyperbole. It's beyond all measure. You, you, you can't understand what it's going to be like. One moment in heaven, as you see this glory revealed, you, it's, it's going to be overwhelming. And notice, not only is it far more exceeding beyond all measure, it's an eternal weight of glory. Eternal weight of glory, it's a never-ceasing abundance of majesty and splendor. A never-ceasing abundance of majesty and splendor. That is what is being offered to us. That's the future that we're hoping in. Verse 18, so it says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. In other words, we get our eyes off the horizontal, we get our eyes onto the vertical. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, I had spring break this week, and, and so I had a lot of time to work on this study. A lot of time to think about these things. And, and the Lord showed me some things, little glimpses as I worked through this. And, and I wish I could somehow convey into you what I saw this week about this. I'm, I'm doing my best. I know it's falling short of what I seek to share. But, but I believe with all my heart that if you and I sit down in these truths, that we get before the Lord and say, Lord, would you... Put me in a place continually that you reveal these things to me, that you help me to walk with you, that I want to grow in you, that I get a, a, a heart uh, and, and a focus on this ending. God will do that, right? The, the, the matter is, are we willing to let go of these things that distract us? These lesser things, these, these temporary things, instead of focusing on the eternal things. Now, as we turn back to 1 Peter 1, we must take note of three vital truths regarding trials. And we'll have slides up here for you to see. The first thing I want you to remember about trials is that trials are temporary. Truth number one, trials are temporary. For the believer, no pain is permanent. Please understand that. Uh, truth number two, trials are necessary. There is no alternate route to Christ-likeness. You, you must endure trials if you wish to be like Christ. And thirdly and finally, when it comes to trials, trials are producing a glorious future. Trials are producing a glorious future for you beyond anything that you can imagine. And so I, I can't wait for the day that I see you in glory and you'll say, Steve, do you remember that one study on this? You way undersold it. <laughs> I can't wait for that day. Now, as we move on in 1 Peter 1, 7, we're gonna see why these various, various temporary trials are necessary. Verse seven, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now the word genuineness means tested and approved. 
tested and approved. And, and so um, it's, it's, you know, like these different products that are taken through this testing process, and then afterwards they're given a stamp of approval. That's the idea. That, that our faith, the genuineness of our faith, it needs to be tested and approved. So a genuine faith that is tested and approved, which according to verse 7, according to Peter, is of much more, valuable, of much more value than gold, because hear me, gold is only precious in this world. Gold is only precious in this world. And people love gold for the simple reason that it gives a person access to glory in this world. If you have gold, you can get what you want. You can have that glory of this world. In contrast to that, genuine faith is of eternal value because it gives you access to eternal glory. So please understand, gold on this earth gives you access to to temporary earthly glory. Genuine faith is of eternal value because it gives you access to eternal glory. That's what Peter's telling us. So continuing on in 1 Peter 1, 7, we read that our faith is to be tested by fire. That word tested means to recognize as genuine after examination, to approve. And then what does fire mean? Well, it speaks about these trials. It speaks of the intensity of trials. We say things like, you know, I, I really went through the fire on that one. So it, it, it speaks of, of a difficulty, a hardship. So in the ancient world, the way that they, I don't know how they do it in the modern world, but in the ancient world, the way they would purify fire, I'm sorry, they would purify gold was by fire. You know, they would smelt it. They would, they would put it in a container. They would heat up the gold and then the dross would rise to the surface and they would scrape off the dross. They would remove the dross and then they would refine it more. And so uh, according to the things that, that I've read, a purifier of gold would know that his gold was pure when he could perfectly see his reflection in the gold. So that's what God's doing with us. You see, God is refining our faith. He's purifying it. He's bringing out the dross. He's bringing out the false expectations. He's bringing out the sinful desires. He's removing those things because his desire is that our faith would be so purified by trials that he might see his reflection in us. That when he sees us, we're like that pure gold and he can see himself in us. I believe this ties to Hebrews eleven six, 6, which says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, our faith to, to be purified must be directed to God. But what happens is we end up putting faith in all these other kind of things and these, you know, human relationships or all this different stuff, and ends up being God plus, God plus, God plus. That plus is the dross. And so God wants us to have a faith that pleases him, a faith that trusts him, a, a, a faith that believes that he is, that he's a, a, the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So he is going to use these fiery trials to refine our faith. To see this clearly, would you turn forward a couple of chapters to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. We'll make it to chapter four someday. First Peter four, verses 12 and 13. Peter says this, I love it, beloved. Peter, the guy who used to, you know, chop a guy's ear off and do different things. He softened over time. He calls these believers beloved. He says, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. So, so God is testing us, trying us with these fiery trials because he wants us to have the maximum amount of joy possible in the future. God is always going for the happy ending, but he's going for the happy ending, not necessarily for the happy middle, <laughs> the happy now. And so we're rejoicing in these fiery trials because we know that the end is great, that we're going to be glorified with him, that, that we're going to enjoy his glory in exceedingly great joy. Now, we're to rejoice in the midst of fiery trials because the refining of our faith leads to a glorious future. So let's turn back to 1 Peter 1, 7, put all the pieces together. It says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, as I did this study, you know, it was, it, it was a little confusing to me 
this phrase may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like, what exactly does that mean? How does this work? Well, as I studied, it seems that that phrase, be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, is the idea of believers being praised, honored, and glorified by the Lord Jesus at his revelation. That actually, God wants to create us, to refine us, to put us in such a place that he is able to praise, honor, and glorify us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In fact, the ESV translates it this way, that it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And isn't that, shouldn't this be obvious to us? Don't you want, as a parent, your children to be in a position to live life in such a way that you can praise them, that you could honor them, that you could say, I, I'm so proud of how you're doing life. You're doing it really well. Well, if, if we as fallen parents want that, how much more does the Lord want that? How much more does the Lord desire that, that he actually is doing all these things in our lives so that he could say, man, I'm proud of you. That's his heart for us. You see, Paul, wrote in, or Paul writes in Romans 2, 7 about those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality that it's actually a good thing for you as a believer to seek for glory, honor, and immortality from the Lord, that you continue in doing good because you're looking forward to that day as Jesus spoke about in Matthew 25, 21, where he could say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's the Lord's heart for you. The Lord wants to say that to you but we have to understand it's not automatic. We, we can't just live however we want in this life and just expect for him to say, well done. He's gonna love us no matter what, but these accolades, this glory, honor, immortality, this, you know, these praise, honor, and glory that he wants to give to us, it's for faithful servants. And that's all it is, it's faithful. It's not that you're awesome. It's not that the world appreciates you. It's not that you can dunk a basketball or any of these things. It's that you did faithfully what God asked you to do in the power that he actually provided you to do those things. So now Peter says that this praise, honor, and glory will be occasioned, again, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's some debate, uh, debate among believers. Is it gonna happen there at the rapture? You know, is it gonna be at the second coming? How is all that gonna work out? I, I don't know. What I, what I do know is that if, if you and I live lives seeking to be obedient to the Lord, submitting to his trials and testing, and say, I just want to do what you want me to do, then whenever the day comes, God is going to glorify, honor, and praise you. He's going to do it. He, he, he's, it says that in the scriptures that he's not unfaithful to forget your labor of love and that you've ministered to the saints and do minister. That, that God will not forget that. All right, let's move on to verse eight now. Peter says, shares these words, whom having not seen you love. You see, the believers that Peter was writing to, they had never seen Jesus during his earthly ministry. And we find ourselves in a similar situation. We have never seen uh, Jesus. And it's so interesting that the person we as believers love most, we haven't seen him. <laughs> that the person we love most in all of life, we haven't seen him face to face. And so it's an opportunity to exercise our faith, but also build anticipation. You know, this is kind of a, a silly illustration, but one of the things that, that made the, the original Jaws movie so good is it took so long to see the shark. You know, and I remember seeing Jaws as a kid, and I, I, I hated going in swimming pools after that. You know, I was real nervous about the situation. But it builds this tension. It builds this anticipation. Well, how much more as you and I faithfully walk with the Lord, building that anticipation of the days coming where I'm gonna see the one that I love. And I can't wait for that day. Now it says, though you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So faith in the Lord Jesus, loving him without seeing him, affords us the opportunity to rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That rejoice with joy, again, it means exultation or great joy. Inexpressible uh, means unspeakable. It means beyond human description. Maybe you have experienced this. I remember clearly on a, I was, I was a Saturday morning, I had been studying at this coffee shop and just the Lord had been, 
I don't know, just revealing himself to me. And I remember sitting in the backyard and sitting outside and I, I just, I felt this. I felt the, the joy inexpressible and full of glory. And I'm sure it's only just a small, a little bit of what the Lord has for us, but it was incredible. If, if I could have bottled that feeling, that experience, I would be the world's richest man. If I could sell that. And so, so that's what the Lord is saying he's offering to us. And that, that phrase, full of glory, it means radiant with glory from above. This is all, we have access to this in the Lord. Verse nine, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That word end is the Greek word telos, means end goal, completion or consummation. And what came to my mind, you know, Lord of the Rings, as it often does, and I think about how Aragorn, all throughout, is he's, he has this quest ultimately to become king, to be the rightful king. But what's interesting about that is he becomes king for a period of time, but then he dies. He's not able to hold on to that. But that's not us. Because when God um, you know, takes us into his kingdom, allows us to reign with him, that's a glory that's not temporary. That's not a glory that's for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 50 years. It's an eternal glory. And so that's what's being spoken of here. It's a glory that comes on forever. He, when he says this salvation, he's talking about here in verse nine, he's speaking of glorification, that final stage of our salvation. So for the smallest glimpse of this glorious future, would you turn to the end of your, a little bit further in the end of your Bible, to Revelation 21. I want to look at Revelation 21, verses one through five. John writes, now just so you realize, this is the new heaven, the new earth. This is, this is after the tribulation period. This is after the millennial kingdom. This is after the great white throne judgment. This is the new heaven, the new earth. This is the, what we might call our eternal state. It says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Verse four is, is, is incredibly important because as I make my case that, that no pain is permanent for the believer, that all our trials are temporary, verse four indicates to us there's coming a day when there's gonna be no more tears. There's coming a day where he'll wipe away every tear. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. You guys won't recognize me without crying. But uh, <laughs> there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. That's a little taste. That's the beginning of what we're gonna experience for eternity. Now, as we turn back to 1 Peter 1, we're gonna move into our second exhortation. And again, we'll just spend a few minutes here. Study your salvation. We find this in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12. Verse 10, Peter writes, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Now, it's interesting, amazingly, what Peter is saying to us is that God's plan was a mystery even to the prophets who prophesied of it. That in other words, the Old Testament prophets, you know, you think about Daniel and you think about Isaiah and you think about Jeremiah and you think about, you know, Malachi and you think about all of these guys, they prophesied these things, but they didn't actually understand how it all fit together. And so this is a reminder to you and I that you and I will not be able to accurately track or predict how God is working out his eternal plan in our lives or in the lives of others. Let me say that again. You and I will not be able to accurately track or predict how God is working out his eternal plan in our lives or in the lives of others. That's just a reality. We're not gonna figure it all out. We're not gonna understand the whole thing. I love Deuteronomy 29, 29. Moses wrote, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So it's a reminder, there are things that have been revealed to us. There are things that we can know about God and about his working and his plan, but there are also some things that are secret, some things that aren't revealed that are held from us. And we have to just be able to be okay with that. I love what Damien Kyle said. Damien Kyle says that, you know, it's gonna be very difficult for you to be a Christian if you can't live with mystery. <laughs> There's just gonna be a mystery to it. In fact, 
we read in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So in the midst of this uh, exhortation to study your salvation that, that God has granted to you, uh, faith is a necessity. As we seek to kind of study salvation and see how it works, there's going to be a lot of things we just have to trust the Lord on that we just can't figure out completely. Now, continuing on in 1 Peter 1 to verse 11, notice he says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, so it's interesting the Holy Spirit referred to as the Spirit of Christ, who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So if you study the Old Testament, what you'll see are these pretty distinct two lines of prophecy of the Messiah. There's a line of, uh, of a prophecy that are called the suffering savior prophecies, that the Messiah was going to be beaten, the Messiah was going to be rejected, all of these things. But there's also another line of prophecies, what we might call the conquering king prophecies, that the Messiah was going to rule and reign and all things were going to be put under his feet. And so the Old Testament prophets did not understand how it all fit together. How can this be? How can it be that he's a suffering savior, but also a conquering king? But we understand it much better because we're a part of the new covenant. We understand that the sufferings of Christ include the various ways that the Lord Jesus was mistreated during his incarnation. He was mocked and persecuted. He was misrepresented and plotted against. He was betrayed and forsaken. He was beaten and crucified. But then we have the glories that would follow that include his resurrection, his ascension, his current position at the right hand of the Father as the Father gathers all the nations under the world under his feet. It, we realize the glory of his second coming, his rule over the nations the, during the millennial kingdom and is seated on the, with the Father on the throne forevermore. And so Jesus spoke about these sufferings and glories. And, and, and please don't, don't lose this because we're, what Jesus has, he's an example for us. Jesus spoke about his sufferings and glories after his resurrection in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27, when uh, there were, you, you guys remember, there were a couple of disciples, they were super bummed out because Jesus had died on the cross and they, they'd heard rumors that he was risen again. They didn't know what to believe. And so this is what Jesus said to them. Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. He said to them, "'O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So here's the vital principle. Here's the, the, the application for you and for me. The cross comes before the crown. The cross comes before the crown. Sufferings come before glory. I can't help to use the word glory and not, not think of Nacho Libre. <sighs> I had to bring it up. I debated. I'm like, I'm leaving it in there. You know, Nacho Libre. If you haven't seen it, you know, what are you doing with your time? Uh, but Nacho Libre, he, he wanted to taste the glory to see what it tasted like, right? That was his desire. And so like all good movies regarding these things, there was a workout montage, right? Where he's going through these workouts. You know, I grew up uh, in the 80s. That was kind of my formative years, and so I watch so many movies with workout montages. You know, there's the Rocky movie and he's got to go and he's got to hit the slab of meat and he's got to do all of these things. And so this suffering before glory and victory is a common staple in movies. But here's what I believe. I believe that God is wanting to speak to us in all of these ways that, that the person who's open to it will see God speaking everywhere. Here's what I want to offer to you. What if your life here on earth is your workout montage? that you are gonna enter into glory, so your whole life on, on earth, however many years, what if that in the grand scheme of things is your workout montage? It's God preparing you for that glory and victory he has for you. I, I would argue that that may be the case, that your glory is gonna be revealed after your suffering, that as you kind of do the same thing every day and you go through the trials of this life and this difficulty and you're faithful in that same job that you've had and you're just doing it again, Maybe that's just because this life is your workout montage that God's preparing you for that victory, preparing you for that glory he has for you. And so I would encourage you to be like Nacho, to seek that glory, but to make sure you seek it from the Lord. All right, this moves us to our final verse, verse 12. 
To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So verse 12 is really telling us that as believers living under the new covenant, we have the incredible privilege of receiving and studying and understanding this divine truth that has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. That you and I have the amazing opportunity to study our salvation, to understand and how it works and what God did and what he's doing for us in the future, that it's an amazing, amazing thing. In fact, that word ministering there in verse 12, it means serving. So those Old Testament prophets were serving us by sharing these things that we would now understand. The Old Testament prophets were serving us as new covenant believers so that we would be, so we would be wise to study what they wrote. And where that it's revealed, notice it says, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Of course, this is a reference to Pentecost, that we now have the Holy Spirit has come upon us as new covenant believers. And then the end of verse 12 is so interesting, things which angels desire to look into. Huh. Angels desire to look into our salvation. Well, because angels can't be saved. Jesus didn't save. So there were good angels, right, who remained good and not in need of salvation. There were the angels who fell, the one-third who followed Satan, and they can't be redeemed. So salvation is something that angels are curious about. Now, this word desire, though, it's not just kind of a passing curiosity. It's, 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 the word desire actually means to long for, to have an earnest, overwhelming desire for that angels are really, really, really interested in our salvation. And then that phrase to look into, it actually means to stoop down to look at a thing, to look so as to understand. It was that same phraseology was used when John came to the empty tomb and he stooped down to look inside. That's what angels desire to do. And now, we, you guys are probably familiar with Luke fifteen ten, where Jesus said, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. These angels desire our salvation. They're interested in it. And so as we kind of begin to wrap up this section and then move into our conclusion, the simple question I would ask related to the end of verse 12 is simply this. If angels desire to look into these things, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't that be a focus of our study and interest? That if angels, these angelic beings who see God face to face, if they're interested in our salvation, then that seems like something we should be interested in as well. So let us study our salvation and rejoice in the incredible grace that God has bestowed on us. We'll stop here for today and Lord willing, pick up in verse 13 next week. But as we close this study, I I exhort each one of us to focus on the ending by first of all, rejoicing in your future. Rejoice in your future, believing that God is at work in the midst of the various temporary trials that you are suffering because he desires to give you the greatest eternal glory possible. And then I exhort you to study your salvation because as you do so, God will continue to grow you into that eternal person that he has created you to be. Let's pray. I cast my mind to God. Where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree.
to serve you and to serve others. May we be the light on a shining hill. May we just continually chase after you, knowing that there is nothing that compares to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a blessed week.